The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast. And the Words of the Prophets Podcast. That's right. It's a special crossover episode. We are joining forces today. We discuss talks from the most recent General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We share some insights, make some connections, and hopefully have a bit of fun as we study the words of the men and women God has called to direct this church in these latter days. I'm Matthew Watkins from the Conference Talk Podcast. And my name is Todd, and I'm here with my friends Rivka and Burke. And this week we are talking about Elder Razvan's talk, To Heal the World. I want to go around and get some introductions from everyone. So tell us a little bit about where you are, where you're from, and what is your most memorable General Conference experience or talk? Thank you, Matthew. So I'll start. My name is Todd, and then I'll pass it off to Rivkin Burke. So yeah, as you said, we're Words of the Prophets podcast. And really, we started um, just as uh, friends who love to talk about General Conference. Rivka had a Facebook page where she talked about General Conference, and I thought it would work really well in a podcast format. And I started that with her and with my daughter. My daughter went out on a mission, and she still participates remotely occasionally just by submitting some some recorded thoughts about each talk. But really now it's uh, me and Rivka and Burke together. So Rivka and Burke are married, and they're uh, a couple who loves to talk about gospel topics. And so we just love to talk about General Conference and, and get all the insights we can from these talks. Um, so for me, I think a powerful general conference talk that I love is Elder Holland's talk about high, the high priest of good things to come. And he tells this story about, you know, leaving um, with his family to drive out somewhere very far away for school and his car breaking down by the side of the road. There's a, a Mormon message about that, and probably they don't call it that anymore. But um, and I loved the story and I was just touched by the simple everyday circumstance, you know, this wasn't something that was, you know, earth shakingly terrible. It's just his car breaking down on the side of the road and, and finding Christ in those um, sort of everyday challenges and the way that, that, um, that he looked forward to with faith and with hope. And as a talk I've gone back to many times and can be broadly applicable to really any of, and of any of life's trials. So of course, Elder Holland is always amazing. So that was 1998, maybe. So this is this is an old one. Awesome, Rivka. Hi, super excited to be here doing this. I, um, yeah, Burke and I have been married for a long time. How long are we married? I don't <laughs> Almost know. Almost 18 years. Almost 18 years. Um, we have two kids, and we are currently living in Vancouver, Washington. <laughs> this whole trip got started because that because I love General Conference. It's one of my favorite. Like I always call it General Conference holiday. Is there any talk in particular that you can just think back to have a a memorable impact on your life? Well, there's <laughs> the one that that was instrumental in convincing me to marry Burke. So I guess that one is. <laughs> oh, so that's Burke's favorite talk, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was President Hinckley. Uh, Ages ago, it was to the Relief Society, and he was he was encouraging getting married and looking for a husband. And during a time when I was dragging my feet, and Burke thought it was a good idea. So that letter to the Salt Lake really worked, huh, man? <laughs> hey, you do what you have to. <laughs> yeah. And then Burke, do you want to share what's a memorable conference experience for you? You can't reuse that one. <laughs> well, Rivka sort of alluded to it. She said he's going to bring up one from Elder Scott, and I am definitely going to bring up one from Elder Scott. Uh, this is a talk called Using the Supernal Gift of Prayer. It's April 2007. It came at a time in my life, right kind of at the end of medical school, right near the end of medical school. I'm just about to start residency, just when a lot of things are in flux. And the advice and the counsel given about how to use prayer and how to receive answers and what it means when you feel like you don't get an answer, I just have gone back to it and back to it and back to it. And it has really 
shaped so many aspects of my life because learning how to pray is so important. Other than that, I'd have to say everything by Elder Maxwell. I actually used to have an Elder Maxwell playlist that I would listen to while I mowed the lawn at our previous house that had a very large lawn. <laughs> so yeah, anything from Elder Maxwell from about 1978 on. Um, yeah, I've listened to those a lot. So Well, cool. Well, let's go ahead and get on to Elder Razvan's talk, which is also just blowing it out of the park. What are some areas of the talk that really jumped out to you, your overall take? This is such an interesting talk. I often read a talk and then go back and read the title of the talk. And sometimes they don't always match up. And then I have to go reread the talk and figure out, okay, why did I, if I had named this talk, I would have named it something different. So I think if I had read this, I would have named it like religious freedom or freedom of religion. And then actually the title of the talk is to heal the world. Um, and so I just, I loved how he tied together um, you know, he, of course, we want our own freedom of religion, but if you just named the talk freedom of religion and it was in general conference, you might think, well, he's just talking about us. Like we need, we need our own freedom of religion, but really he has so many references in here to other faiths and, um, the power of religion, be it our religion or other religions to help uplift people, um, to inspire people, to care for people. And he sort of goes through that in a stepwise fashion. Um, but I, I'm going to jump in to, um, number his second point that he really um, pulled out because I just loved what he said here. Religious freedom fosters expressions of belief, hope, and peace. And what a succinct way of talking about one of the benefits of religion, um, of all religions for all people, that we can have hope and peace um, through the power of that faith. And of course, we have faith in Jesus Christ, but um, having something higher than yourself, a greater purpose in your life is going to benefit you, whether, um, you know, you're, you're following Christ or some other faith. Um, so that was just a powerful thing for me to think of as to expand that religious freedom outside of my own circle into the whole world. And really just think about the, the faith and the hope and the peace that is, is fostered throughout the world through religious freedom. So that was something I really appreciated. You know, it's interesting. The three things he calls out there, belief, hope, and peace. What is it that Satan has got so prevalently fixed in the minds of people in the world that religion actually puts into you? The opposite of belief is doubt and ignorance. They think that, okay, you, know, you, you become religious, you start ignoring science, and you're therefore ignorant, right? You say hope, and well, no, now you're just afraid of this judgment, and that's the only reason you're being good. Can't you just be good for goodness sakes? And peace, they say, well, now you're feeling guilty all the time, and it's a shame culture. And so you're just, you know, high anxiety and everything like that. When really, it's, it's the exact opposite of the three virtues and the three blessings that religion really does provide. Yeah, that's, that's a really great insight. I really appreciate that. And I think if you, it's the way Satan twists things, right? He turns good into bad and, and bad into good. And um, these are all beautiful principles. And if you're following your religion, and especially if you you follow Christ, you're going to feel that belief, hope, and peace. And maybe if you look from the outside, you might think some of those things. Or maybe if you had a bad experience with someone who didn't understand, you know, doctrine or principles that are true and correct. But yeah, what a great insight that Satan has convinced people that religion offers the opposite of what it really does. And religious freedom is just completely downplayed. I mean, we didn't hear it hardly addressed in general conference, at least most of my lifetime, until about the 2010s you started seeing it crop up more and more and more frequently in general conference addresses. And Elder Razman does not beat around the bush. Even from the second paragraph, he says, there's another script. So he talks about COVID-19 and all the problems that we're having, plagues and fires and pestilence, pestilences and abominations. And, you know, obviously we have the war in Ukraine going on right now. He says, there's another scourge sweeping the globe, attacks on your and my religious freedom. He really doesn't beat around the bush. He says, this is up there in terms of, disasters. This is up there in terms of world crises. And this is echoed a little bit by Elder Bednar's uh, G20 address, which he gave uh, the year before. Religious freedom is fragile. As we have just experienced, religious freedom can quickly be swept aside in the name of protecting other societal interests. Despite COVID-19 risks, North American jurisdictions declared as essential Numerous services related to alcohol, animals, marijuana, and other concerns. But often religious organizations and their services were simply deemed non-essential, even when their activities could be conducted safely. This is a wake-up call for all of us. 
we cannot allow government officials to treat the exercise of religion as simply non-essential. Never again must the fundamental right to worship be trivialized below the ability to buy gasoline. Never again. I, I don't think apostles tend to be prone to hyperbole, um, not like our, our favorite political pundit sometimes. I think that when he says this is a very serious issue, they mean it. Well, I think it's interesting that um, he defines religious freedom. Um, and I forget sometimes that these talks are going out to a worldwide audience, right? And so I like that he defines it here. It is freedom to worship in all its configurations, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom to act on personal beliefs, freedom for others to do the same. Religious freedom allows each of us to decide for ourselves what we believe, how we live and act according to our faith and what God expects of us. And then he follows a few paragraphs down with a quote from Joseph Smith, where he said, I am bold to declare before heaven that I am just as ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any other denomination. For the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the saints would trample upon the rights of the Roman Catholics or of any other denomination who may be unpopular and too weak to defend themselves. And when I first read this talk, I thought, well, is he focusing on us fighting for religious freedom or us making sure that we grant religious freedom to the others? And I think the answer is both. We need to realize that if we want to have the freedom to speak our own minds, we also have to permit that freedom to others. Is that easier said than done sometimes? Absolutely. <laughs> my beliefs are my beliefs. I held them very strongly. And I feel like everyone else who's an intelligent, well-informed should feel the same way. But that is just not how it works. You know, you look back a few decades when the, when the Nazis marched through Skokie, right? And the government's like, no, when we say freedom of speech, we even mean vile speech that 99.9% .9 of the population thinks is morally abhorrent. I don't know that we would have the same standard today. I don't know that as a society, we would have the same mix of tolerance slash loathing. I, I hate what you're saying, but I'll defend your right to say it. I don't know that we're at the point in society where that would actually be tolerated it is interesting to see that we are as a society becoming a lot more picky about what we will and will not allow to be said in the public square. You know, how many things in my, you know, moral compass or values that I hold dear could I discuss openly at work? And the answer is almost none. Not if I want to keep my job. I work at a big tech company. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Elder Rasband said when he talks about this history of persecution that really existed in the entire world until you know the turn of the 19th century um, at the establishment of the United States and the actual enforcement of the Constitution uh, across the nation. He, he talks about our own history of persecution, and then he says, Latter-day Saints are no different. Like, you know, the persecution we experience in Missouri is a common tradition of Christianity, of every other religion, has started at one point as a minority religion and has faced this kind of persecution. As you guys were talking, I was thinking about those people who are not in our country where, um, you know, we don't face that anymore. Um, of course, we all know the, the laws about exterminating Mormons were on the books in Missouri till the 70s. But, you know, those those days are long gone in terms of, of physical persecution. But even now we have a missionary from our ward who's out in Mongolia. And, um, you know, I don't think he's faced anything necessary physical, physical, you know, in terms of persecution, but he can't proselyte or tract. He can only teach English. And, um, you know, there, there are consequences if you don't um, follow the rules there. And uh, so they, the people have to come to them and say, hey, we're interested in the church. And then, of course, there are countries where we can't even go into those countries and teach the gospel. So I, I sometimes forget that we have relative religious freedom in the United States. And of course, Elder Bednar addressed some of the recent things, as you mentioned, Matthew. But um, I think, you know, it's a good reminder. You, you're both reminding me that this is, this is a worldwide religion and the gospel applies to everyone and lots of people can't even access it still. And they're still, if, you, if they tried, they would be persecuted. Yep. It, it really puts in perspective. We're having, you know, national dialogue on whether or not you should have to bake a cake. Yeah, you know, when when in other countries people are getting scourged and beheaded, and you know there are very stiff penalties associated in both directions. So this might be an interesting time to introduce a discussion about the four ways that he says society and individuals benefit from religious freedom. Because we've talked about the contrasting things, and we can hear stories about what happens in other places. But I've only ever lived in the United States with a pretty free exercise of religion, all things considered. Well, I lived for a time in the Middle East and 
And that was one of the places where there was no proselyting. My dad had an experience where he was actually, he was asked by someone and even then was not allowed to answer questions. And the person ended up saying, I have a, a brother that lives down in Africa. If I go there, can I find out? And he said, yes. And so he was <laughs> decided he was going to go for a visit so that he could find out more about the church. Couldn't even give him like a website or anything. So all of that being said, Elder Razband discusses four ways that both societies and individuals can benefit from this religious freedom. Like, why should we be worried about, I mean, lots of people are like, we should be worried that we get to have our say, but why should we be encouraging a situation in which anybody from any belief background should be able to have a say? Um, And he gives four things. So maybe we could talk about that. Can I jump in, Rivka? I think for the conference talk listeners who haven't listened to our podcast before, they should know that Rivka loves lists. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a natural gravitation for me. So you really like Elder Bednar's talks, huh? I I do love Elder Bednar's talk. (laughs) They're the most structured general conference talks of all time, yes. (laughs) But if somebody says the word first and then the later there's a second, like Rivka's there for it. I'm on it. So I don't know, Rivka, I'd love to hear your take. What are the four four things and what do you have to, how do you tie them together? Yeah. The first one is that religious freedom honors the first and second great commandments, placing God at the center of our lives. Second is that religious freedom fosters expressions of belief, hope, and peace. We kind of talked about that one a little earlier. Um, The third is that religion inspires people to help others. And the fourth, that freedom of religion acts as a unifying and rallying force for shaping values and morality. And what I thought was interesting when I read through this talk and saw this list is as I read each one immediately popping into my head was like any argument against the point that I'd ever heard, which is, which is interesting because I don't really seek that stuff out. I don't, you know, I don't, read a lot of negative political, I don't know, barter stuff, argument stuff. So this is just stuff that I have run across in just daily living of my life. There are so many arguments against each of these points. And I think that's significant that there's so much, um, I mean, it's anger, but sometimes it's vitriolic. Like there's a lot of hatred for some of these points. So one, placing God at the center of our lives. You know, I actually think that one goes a lot with the last one, which is that um, freedom of religion acts as a unifying and rallying force for shaping values and morality. And then he, he says this, he has this paragraph that he says afterwards that is just one of the most bold things that I've heard in conference so far. Um, He says, a cry is still being heard today from those who seek to expel religion from discourse and influence. But if religion is not there to help with shaping character and mediating hard times, who will be? Who will teach honesty, gratitude, forgiveness, and patience? Who will exhibit charity, compassion, and kindness for the forgotten and the downtrodden? Who will embrace those who are different yet deserving, as are all of God's children? Who will open their arms to those in need and seek no recompense? Who will reverence peace and obedience to laws greater than the trends of the day, who will respond to the Savior's plea, go and do thou likewise? And then he says, we will. Yes, brothers and sisters, we will. But that's an, that's an oh, it's a really bold statement because you, can you just hear people being like, you don't have to be religious to be good, and mm-hmm. w- which is true, you know, and, and there's good things that come from all these places, but I just think- We're saying that religion does more harm than good. That's a common argument. I know. Strong societies are all built somewhat- on religious principles. Ours is, we call it a Judeo-Christian, right? And so whether you're Jewish or Christian or not, you're influenced by societies and political ideologies and even scientific discoveries and things that, that are made and based on these principles of morality that were given by religion. It's a hard thing to try to, to argue for something where you're so separate from religion because None of us are. Even if we're not religious, we're still f- shaped and formed by societies that have these religious moral ideas as a base. As President Oaks, when he talked about the Constitution, just in the October 2021 conference, he talks about how that Constitution was the model for the majority of governments in existence today and all the constitutions that have followed for. And what did John Adams say about our Constitution? 
it was built for a moral and religious people, and it would be insufficient for any other type of people. They just break through it like a whale breaks through a net. Built into all these constitutions in all the world, there is that same religious moral underpinning. But it makes sense, because if God is, is the father of us all, and he created the universe and all that in there is, there's no, there's no escaping him. We can certainly do a good job of trying to change or ruin, or sometimes claim, uh, claim that we came up with an idea, or we came up with a, <laughs> a thought, or we are doing good. But if, if he gives us the very breath we have, then we are living our lives at his pleasure and and coming to earth with the light of Christ in us recognized or not so all good comes from comes from God and and this is i think what elder raven is <laughs> trying to say here is if good is being done it is from God and if it is not being done it is not from God and uh, religion <laughs> religions claiming it or no uh, we need to have the freedom to be able to have religious beliefs and express a belief in God and give credit to God where credit is due. When he starts his first point here, he says something that, like you said, cuts right against the argument contrary to religious freedom. He said, religious freedom honors the first and second great commandments. That's really interesting. He mentioned and second, and then he goes on to quote and remind people what the first and second commandments are. He's intimating here that the second commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves, that is something we can only fully do when we have the full liberty of religious freedom. The counter argument lots of people make is that, well, you just want to be able to say this, you just want to be able to preach, you just want to be to aggrandize yourselves and proselyte and join others to the cause and increase your tithing donations. No, without full religious freedom, our ability to serve others is hampered. And I just thought that's a really good way to say, no, this is not just an inward thing. This is an outward cause as well. When he talks about banding with people of other faiths, it was really touching when he said, we have more in common than we have with those who desire to silence us. You know, sometimes we see bad blood between different religious groups. Traditionally, you know, the church maybe hasn't had as great relationships um, until very recently with a lot of religious organizations. But I really like the voice of unity and the voice of um coming together in the common cause that we're really starting to see a lot more, especially under President Nelson. Um, and Elder Rasband really hit home on that when he was describing this trip that he took to the G20 uh, Interfaith Forum in Italy. Did you guys get a chance to see the headlines or hear snippets of his talk there? I didn't hear anything, no. I read a little bit in the church newsroom, and it was just really cool. Apparently, the church has not actually been consistently participating in the Interfaith Forum but we have been for the last four years, the last four consecutive years, we have had an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking at the World Interfaith Forum, which I think is just awesome. That is pretty cool when you think about it. And I've had that reflected in my personal life, too, where I had a few friends talk to me about, you know, they're, they're Christian and talk to me about some of the sort of Christian approached um anti-Mormon or whatever you would call it nowadays, anti-church, um, you know, teachings. And I often just tell them like, hey, let's zoom way out and look at all the forces arrayed against Christianity and religion in general. I think we're on the same team here and maybe we can put aside some of our differences in doctrine. Like, okay, we, you believe in the Trinity, we believe something different than, you know, those sorts of things or faith and works and grace and all the traditional Christian sort of arguments. And uh, let's just talk about, um, you know, the good that religion does in our lives and our, our Christian faith does in our lives. And and I think Elder Rasband does a great job of focusing on that here, just saying all these four things, these are things that all religions across the world all, you know, benefit everyone who has any religion and, and lumps us all together, not even just Christians, but everybody who has faith. And he's really trying to, to draw those, you know, uh, bind us all tighter together. The other story I like since we were talking about the G20 in here is, you know, when he comes to the end of his talk and no one else had closed, you know, using, uh, what does he say? Uh, the previous seven speakers had not closed in any manner of a faith tradition or in the name of God. As I spoke, I thought, do I just say thank you and sit down or do I close in the name of Jesus Christ? I remembered who I was and I knew the Lord would have me say his name to conclude my message. So I did. And I just feel like if he can feel that pressure in his calling 
that uh, it makes sense now. I, I feel the same pressure sometimes too. You know, even I was at work yesterday and um, someone there said, oh, you know, what are your plans for the weekend? You know, what are you doing on Saturday? And I was like, well, let's see. Uh, we're going to the temple and I'm recording a podcast. It's all running through my mind. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to talk about this. It might be awkward. And I was like, like I'll have lunch. <laughs> yeah. It's the one not church related thing. Oh wait, I'm going to bless the food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, like, yeah, today was super church related. And, and I had that little war in my mind for just a second. I was like, well, actually here's my schedule, you know? And so I threw it out there and, you know, then there was a question like, so you're going to church? I said, well, no, going to the temple. It's actually a little different. I said, you know, our temples actually aren't even open on Sunday. And it was a very brief discussion. And as it always has in my life thus far, but maybe someday it will be different. When I bring up anything about the church, it just kills the conversation and everyone changes subject and moves on really quickly. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but I'm always hopeful that one time it won't. And at the same time, I was glad afterwards that I, that I hadn't glossed over it because there's always that temptation to hide just a little bit. Well, we think about how much time we put into our church activities. If we're living our lives right, the gospel is the core of our lives. And so if someone only gets to know the external pieces and they don't realize, you know, where we put so much time and where we put so much energy and effort and what motivates us. And we're not really being our authentic selves. And after all, isn't this world all about being our authentic selves? That's what I'm told, right? <laughs> yeah. What I really like in the quote you just shared from Elder Rasband, where he was deciding whether or not to pray in the name of Jesus Christ, I had a similar experience, not nearly to this level. Um, when I was in high school, I participated in uh, what they called youth in government or youth legislative assembly, where we all we all we all convene together and we basically pretend to be legislators and we write bills and we vote on them and constitutional amendments and you've got the veto power. It's all these different offices. It's really really fun, especially for a policy wonk like me. Um, but one year, I I was the chaplain for the the Senate is is basically what it was, and so I was asked to give a prayer in front of all of these students in North Carolina who'd gathered from all over the state. So a few thousand students and I'm asked to give a prayer at the beginning of the the meal and they asked me, okay, yeah, just just say this, but don't like we've got we've got Muslims here, we've got Jews here, we've got Christians here, we've got atheists, we've got you know students, and this is a semi, you know, educational thing. It's got tie in from the official school district because I was I was asked not to, you know, pray in any specific, you know, religious tradition. It was really weird and hard to go through a prayer and not to close in the name of Jesus Christ. And it felt wrong. And so when he was expressing this, I'm thinking, man, I know a little bit of what that feels like, except with him, I guess he had the option to. And I love this line when he was debating whether or not to say it. He said, I remembered who I was. What a line that is. Now, he probably was referring more to his calling as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and an official representative and a special witness of the Savior, which we are not. But we are all children of God. And through our actions and the way that we live our lives, we are always supposed to represent the Savior and the church. And so when I read it, I said, yeah, I, I need to be a little bit more bold. I wish that I'd be, maybe been a little bit more bold in uh, when I was asked to give the prayer and maybe push back on that a little bit and say, you know, I, how can I pray to a God who has no name? You know, I've probably seen if there was a way that I could have inclu included a little bit of my faith tradition into that prayer. So it, was, it, it really hit home for me, that, that story. Uh, another part of that experience that he had at the G20 Interfaith Forum. Um, he said, I was encouraged and even buoyed up when I met with government and faith leaders from around the world. I realized wounds and differences can be resolved and even healed when we honor God, the Father of us all, and Jesus Christ. His Son, the great healer of all, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That was one of my favorite statements in this whole talk because, because it's... A bold truth. And, and as I was reading it, I was thinking that I, this is what we are going to see more. I mean, we're going to see a lot of, of difficult things as we get closer to the second coming. But I think we are going to see this more too, because this is the work of the Savior and the entire reason for his second coming and the millennial time we spend on the earth. All of that is, is his work of healing. And so despite the fact that things, you know, might get rough <laughs> here as we get closer to the second coming, I believe we are going to see healing happening um, among people of faith and, and a unity in certain works and endeavors as we come, um, you know, as we 
in the church are doing our work to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so I think that's a very hopeful thing in a conversation that can sometimes get really discouraging because there's, (laughs) there's a lot to battle. I love that he, he adds this piece in because this is the hopeful forward moving part that is what the gospel of Jesus Christ brings. And that is healing and and hope and a path toward the Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Savior and Redeemer of the world, all of us, whether we are people of faith or not. You know where I can see a lot of that healing happening is the chosen. The way that many members of the church and even the church itself, to a degree, has gotten involved with the chosen and come together. I love obviously watching the chosen. I follow Dallas Jenkins and hear his commentary as he's recording the new seasons. And he talks about the wealth of interfaith collaboration that goes on there. And it is surprising to many people to see the Latter-day Saints so involved and so enthusiastic about depicting this evangelical style Jesus, right? And like, wait a minute, you believe that he did? Yeah, yeah, no, this is 100% like we believe, 100% like the Catholics believe, 100% like every every faith believes. This is the core doctrine of, of how the Savior was. It's not a show proselyting the church, obviously, nor do I think it should be, right? It is w- exactly what it's supposed to be. But the fact that the church and church members are so enthusiastic about it gives us this great grounding point when we talk with members of other Christian faiths that we're both zealously enthusiastic that this wonderful resource is out there. I got excited when I was reading and hearing a lot of the interface stuff going on, on on that project. Yeah, and I think we can be hopeful and expectant that we will see more of that as the years progress. Because as Satan unleashes his storms, people of faith, even if we don't agree about everything, we're going to band together to fight against those storms, or at least to brace each other against the storms. Elder Asban says this, no question, people of faith working together can make significant interventions. At the same time, one-on-one service is often unheralded, but quietly changes lives. And then he shares a story from the New Testament. But when we're talking about religious freedom, giving us personal freedoms to act and express belief, I think this is one of the most important points. I mean, we tend to talk about this on a grand scale and nations or Um, political ideologies, but the individual practice of our religion is the most influential on communities. And if our communities are strong, then our states are strong and our nations are strong. And, And so I think it's so important to keep this discussion going about the individual practice and ability to communicate that we are doing this as, as disciples of Jesus Christ or as members of a, you know, a, of another faith or um, believers of, you know, those who practice, who practice the good teachings of, of Buddhism or, or follow the teachings of the prophet Muhammad, being able to express that and tell someone that this foundational part of you is why you're, why you are doing this and sharing that with them is so important in, in creating bonds um, and understanding with people. And so, you know, this religious freedom, it it affects us individually. And we can talk about it as how, like my personal religious freedom, in addition to discussing it on a bigger, grander scale, you know, this affects us daily, and it can affect our ability to, to go about doing good. If we don't have these freedoms, it affects our service. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much service would we be doing if we did not have this great organization providing us structured opportunities to reach out in ways we couldn't reach otherwise. And I think President Oaks hit on that in his talk from, was it one or two conferences ago, titled The Need for a Church. Yeah, two conferences ago. Yep. And then fourth, he says, freedom of religion acts as a unifying and rallying force for shaping values and morality. And this hits on to what Todd hit on earlier. Or actually, no, it was you, Rivka, who hit on it earlier. He said, yeah, this counters the arguments made against religion. Their assumption is, well, if religion weren't there, pe- there'd just be as much service. People would step up to the plate. People would be good for goodness sake. And Elder Razman's saying, no, you need that centralized structure that people can catalyze, that people can bind around a nucleation point. <laughs> it's basically <laughs> what it's like, like yeah. dropping Mentos into a diet soda, right? You didn't change the soda. The potential for that kind of reaction is always there. But without that nucleation point, you don't get that kind of directed focus. 
you know, ultimately all people of religion are going to have to band together and gain strength from that. You know, it is a unifying and a, and a rallying force, mm-hmm. even if we don't agree on every single point of doctrine. So, yep. And then to conclude, as all good missionaries do, Elder Rasban issues an invitation at the end of his message. He says, I invite you to champion the cause of religious freedom. So he, he's asking us to, you know, go out and get involved to some extent. Now, what kind of forms could that take in our lives? You know, obviously writing letters to our senators or whatever, if we see a bill that threatens religious freedom. But how does that look in our own lives? Now, I think it was you, Burke, that you and I both kind of bonded on the fact that we're in companies, we're in organizations professionally where, you know, we know that if we were to try, if we were to be quite open about what we believe, especially maybe in regards <laughs> to, you know, social doctrines, yeah. uh, we'd find ourselves on, on on a quick chat with HR, right? <laughs> well, not HR so much in my company because um, I actually do general anesthesia for pediatric dentists in their offices, but I would very quickly, I think, find that I'd be uninvited to a lot of offices. So, yeah, I mean, we live in the Pacific Northwest, so <laughs> there isn't a lot of socially acceptable moral belief here that aligns with what the church teaches. So Yes. Well, now that could be a strength. The way that I teach the gospel, according to my kids, is great at putting people to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. You know, I think one of the easiest maybe things that any of us can do to champion the cause of religious freedom is to set the example of offering it to others. Yes. Be interested and and curious about about theirs. Let them discuss their religious beliefs. Let them um let them have that moment and you be a support um to them and and an encouragement to them to to express their beliefs and to and to be open in in living those and declaring them. I think if that was the thing that everybody did, this problem would go away, <laughs> right? If everyone would just let other people have this freedom. So but that's something that you and I can go out and do tomorrow. If you run into someone and, and you know, or, or you're at work and maybe you ask them what they're doing and they say church, and then maybe you don't share anything about the gospel this time, but you give them an opportunity and a space to discuss their um, religious experiences or beliefs, or maybe even their religious doubts. Um, and maybe you do the the same for people who are not of religious faith and offer them the space to discuss their, their beliefs and their, you know, reasons for things. If we just open those doors and, and let people be, that would be a huge fix for this. That's a really good point, Rivka. We talk about religious freedom and we think about policies. Politics is downstream of culture. If we establish a culture of openness and of the expectation that people should live their religion and that it's beautiful. And I really like Christer Standall, where he talks about holy envy, where we can have holy envy and recognize the good in other religions without compromising on our doctrines. If we can grassroots that kind of culture, then the whole problem is solved, right? We don't have to worry about you know seeking specific policies quite as stringently. And then, of course, Elder Razvan closes like all good missionaries. After issuing an invitation, he closes with his testimony. And I really love it when the apostles bear testimony. There is a power there that you don't hear when members bear their testimony because they really are special witnesses. When he says, I testify that Jesus Christ leads and guides this church, there's a significance there when it comes from one of the Lord's special witnesses and someone who is well acquainted with his voice. So it's just really beautiful. This was a great talk. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk and the Words of the Prophets podcast. That's right. And today we discussed Elder Razvan's talk to heal the world. If you enjoyed this episode, give us both a five-star rating. You can find us all on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google, Stitcher, Amazon, Audible, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Facebook, and anywhere that you get your podcast. You can find links to all our platforms for Conference Talk at conferencetalk.org. And for Words of the Prophets... Well, we don't have a website, but if you just search on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook for Words of the Prophets podcast, you can find us there or email us at words of the prophets podcast at gmail.com. Awesome. Big thanks to Todd and Burke and Rivka for hopping on mics with me today. Follow them, please. They are awesome. And of course, we were missing one of your hosts, which is sad, but say hello to her for us. Yeah, she'll be back here in about a year. So we, uh, we love her and miss her, but um, it's, been, it's been great to see her grow on our mission too. 
And remember that while we as podcasters always appreciate new followers, it's even better to follow the prophets and the apostles themselves. We love speaking about the church. We love speaking about our leaders, but we do not speak for them. Everything said on these podcasts represent our own personal opinions and not the opinion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 